Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast sharing how to create and grow income streams and manage, multiply, and protect your wealth in the new economy. Are you tired of trading your time for money? Do you desire freedom today instead of retirement in 10, 20, or 30 years? I'm MC Lobsher, and this is the Cashflow Ninja. Hello, Cashflow Ninjas. MC Lobsher here, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you today, and today I'm joined by my friend, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, author, a uh, very successful guy, and I'm super excited to have him on the show. I was um, uh, able to meet him in person, Mr. Jay Scott, at a recent event, um, and Jay is also the host of the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast that I would highly recommend you check out. Great show where he shares so much valuable information. It's on my listening list. Uh, Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks, MC. So glad to be here. I appreciate you having me. Uh, for my listeners not familiar with you and what you, uh, what you currently do and what you're involved with, can you please share a little bit about your background and journey with them? Absolutely. So uh, I spent much of my career before real estate in the corporate world. I'm an engineer by trade. I'm a business guy. Um, and so I jumped into real estate in 2008 during the, I guess, what a lot of people consider the worst time in history to be getting into real estate, uh, though it worked out well for us. My wife and I uh, had decided to get married, start a family. So we left the corporate world. We're looking for something to do next. We had no idea what that would be. Um, I had never done real estate before. She had never done real estate. We had literally just purchased our first personal residence. Uh, to summer 2008, while we're trying to figure out what to do, my wife is watching a, a TV show, an HGTV show about flipping houses. And she says, well, while we're trying to figure out what we want to do with our lives, let's flip a house. It'll be fun. And I thought she was kidding, but she was serious. So uh, I started learning about real estate. I started learning about flipping a house or flipping houses. And we eventually, a few months later, we found our first house that we wanted to flip. And again, this was just going to be like a one-time thing just to, to keep my wife happy because she needed something to do. And that one flip somehow turned to two to five to 10 to 50. And here we are 12 years later and we've done about 350 flips. We've done a bunch of other stuff in real estate and, and uh, touched pretty much every niche. Uh, and so that's kind of how it started with us. It, it, it wasn't a planned thing. We kind of fell into real estate. We fell into flipping houses. And uh, again, here we are 12 years later and it's just kind of snowballed for us. And you've been involved in quite a number of niches. Uh, so if you don't mind sharing that with real estate, you started with the flips. Uh, maybe you can share the just the progression that you had, uh, you and your wife had on your journey. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a big proponent of being opportunistic. Um, I'm a big fan of looking around, seeing what's working, what's not working. And I'm not scared to change my strategy based on a changing market, changing conditions, based on uh, things that may be working now that weren't working before, or getting rid of things that were working before that aren't working now. So 2008 to 12 or so, literally every flip we did, literally 100, 150 flips from 2008 to 12 were REOs, basically bank owned foreclosures listed right on the MLS that were buying off the MLS, flipping and putting back on the MLS. Uh, 2012, we started to realize that uh, there weren't that many REOs anymore. So we started doing short sales. Short sales started to become popular. And I started to realize that a lot of people were moving towards buy and hold. So there were some good buy and hold deals. The market was shoring up. And I, I finally felt comfortable saying, hey, I'm going to buy some real estate to start holding and uh, generate some cash flow. So 2012, we kind of moved to, we kept flipping, we were doing short sales, um, but we also started doing buy and hold. Uh, that 2012 to now we've done buy and hold. 2014, um, we realized that uh, that short sales weren't working as well as they were. And there's a lot of competition for flips. So we kind of got into new construction. We realized that there was some opportunity with big flips, doing additions, things called pop tops, where you add the second story, doing ground up construction. We, we saw a niche there that we thought would work well because Basically, nobody else wanted to do that. Everybody was focused on those, those cosmetic rehabs. So we kind of jumped into the, the new construction uh, field. And we also learned about notes. We realized there's a thing called notes that people were basically generating cash flow from real estate without actually holding the underlying real estate. So around 2014, 15, we, we jumped into notes as well. So we did that for a couple of years. Um, 
2016, 2017, we started to realize, hey, there are some other niches that, that might be attractive. So we started looking at multifamily. We started looking at mobile homes and mobile home parks. Uh, we started looking at, and more from an, uh, a passive investing side, we started looking at things like self-storage facilities, investing in other people's deals. Um, basically, every step of the way, we just kept asking ourselves, what's no longer working? What looks like it's going to be working in the near future? And, and again, that's not, uh, it's not, uh, 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 brain surgery. It's not rocket science. Basically, we were just looking at what other people who were smarter than we were, were starting to get into. And we said, oh, okay, maybe there's a niche we should investigate. So literally we went from flipping to rentals, to notes, to mobile homes, to multifamily. Um, we've done a little bit of everything at this point. We're doing a lot of lending now. Um, we're investing in other people's uh, syndications. Uh, we're getting ready to start syndicating ourselves if we can find uh, the right deals. Uh, basically, Basically, we're, we're constantly looking for those, those opportunities that didn't exist last year, but that we think are going to exist this year, next year, and the year after. And we're not scared to change our strategy. Love it. I love it. Uh, played a lot of Monopoly, right? Uh, you know, Jay and his wife played Monopoly in real life. And what I love about it is, in the end, you figure out, too, uh, within a long with, within your strategy, you're incorporating being the bank as well. So playing Monopoly in real life and being the bank through the lending process. The 1% grow their business and investments every year, regardless of the economy and marketplace, and pay very little or no taxes legally. Besides having the right mindset, elite strategies and tactics, and the counsel of elite wealth advisors, coaches, and mentors, they have access to opportunities that the rest of the population do not. If you're an accredited investor, we have a network that provides Cashflow Ninja listeners access to exclusive business and investment opportunities. To join our investors network, please apply at CashflowNinjaInvestorsNetwork.com. That's CashflowNinjaInvestorsNetwork.com. Jay, what are some of the things that you could share with our listeners and our viewers um, that you, uh, I would say that there's a learning curve to everything, right? And in real estate, there's a learning curve. If Maybe if there's a couple of things that you can share that can cut down the learning curve and collapse time, if you want to use that concept, uh, within their journey uh, from learning from successful folks such as yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my big thing is is real estate and i know a lot of people when you're first jumping in i know when i first jumped in i was terrified um it, it, it always feels like you can lose a lot of money you can make a lot of big mistakes but what i've learned over the last 12 years is that real estate one it's not rocket science um it, it's i'm, I'm not going to say it's simple and you can just go out and do it tomorrow um but you don't need to be, you don't have to have 150 IQ. You don't need to have a college degree or a graduate degree to, to flip houses or to buy investment real estate or to do notes or to do multifamily or to lend money. It, it's really the, the basics are not that complicated. The key is understanding the basics, getting your head around the process, and then implementing. So the first thing I would say is get out of the mindset that this is really, really hard. Um, number two, get out of the mindset that this is really, really risky. Now, certainly there are parts of real estate that are more risky than others. If just like anything, if you jump in with zero knowledge, with, with, with no thoughts, you're too aggressive. Um, certainly you can lose a lot of money, but if you're conservative, you do your research, you focus on those niches that are somewhat more resistant to making big mistakes. Um, it's hard to lose a lot of money in real estate. I mean, honestly, I can count on, on one hand the number of people I know that have lost a lot of money on their first deal and it wasn't something that was completely avoidable. Uh, they jumped in before they really started to learn. They trusted somebody that they shouldn't have trusted. Um, they bought a house that was outside of their, their comfort level. Um, if you avoid doing those really big things that are easy to avoid, um, it's really hard to lose a lot of money in real estate, especially if you're conservative. Um, so that's the next thing I would say, always be conservative. I look back at the first deal that we did and we made every mistake in the book. We overpaid for the property. We underestimated the rehab cost. We held the property for two and a half years. It was supposed to be a flip and we couldn't flip it. So we held it for two and a half years. We had to do a second rehab. And then at the end of the day, we ended up selling that property about three years later 
for less than we originally projected three years earlier. So literally, we made every mistake, paid too much, too long, too, too, too long of a hold time, uh, spent too much on the rehab, did multiple rehabs, and then sold it for, for less than we expected. We still made about $1,200 profit on that deal. And the reason we made profit on that deal is because when we went in, we were tremendously conservative with our numbers. We assumed we were going to pay too much. We assumed we were going to underestimate the rehab. We assumed we were going to underestimate our holding time. We assumed that we were going to overestimate the ARV. We, we assumed that we were going to make a mistake every step of the way. And we made sure that the numbers still worked, even knowing we were going to make all those mistakes. And we basically broke even. And what I tell people is if we can break even on that really horrible first deal that we did simply because we were conservative, that's just a testament to the fact that being conservative can save you from 95% of the mistakes you can make in this business. Final thing I'm going to say on this is there is, and, and there are no secrets in real estate. There are no secrets in, in, in any real estate niche, but the closest thing I've seen to a secret in real estate is this. I have pretty much never, I, there, there are two types of people I meet in real estate. Um, and there are, I've met thousands of people that have never, ever done a deal. They've done zero deals. I have met thousands of people that have done two, five, 10, 50, a hundred deals. I never, ever, ever meet anybody that's done one deal in real estate. And the reason for that is if you get that first deal, you're going to get the second, you're going to get the third, you're going to get the fifth, you're going to get the 10th, you're going to get the 50th. Because after you get that first deal, you realize it's not that hard. You have some context. You can put that process in, into play. You realize that, wow, if I just do exactly what I did on that first deal, the next ones are going to be easy. So I don't meet anybody that's done one deal. I meet those people that give up before they get to one. And then yep. I meet those people that get to one and they get much further. So what I like to tell people is if you can get that first deal done, it's going to get so much easier. You're going to get the second. You're going to get the fifth. You're going to get the 10th. Don't give up until you get that first deal because I promise you, if you get the first, you're going to get a whole lot more. It's so true. It's it's almost like, um, yeah, it's kind of like cooking <laughs> for me, I would think, right? So when you have a recipe and, you know, very basic stuff, but you put that recipe together that you've copied obviously from someone that's a successful cook or a chef right and you put it and you cook it for the first time and you go huh that wasn't so bad i mean i followed the recipe the blueprint that was there i did everything that i was supposed to do and you know i don't have to throw this away i can actually enjoy <laughs> enjoy it right exactly and it may not be perfect but it's yep. going to be good enough. And the second one's going to be 10 times better because you can fix all those mistakes you made the first time. And the second and the third's going to be 10 times better and 10 times easier. The fifth time you do, it's going to be 10 times better and 10 times easier. Um, because you realize after the first time that most of what caused you issues, most of what kept you from getting that first deal was mindset. Yeah. And after you get that first deal, you're no longer in that, that, that mindset that I can't do this. You're now in the mindset that not only can I do it, but it's not that hard. And it takes that first deal to really flip that mindset from this is really hard. I'm not sure I can do it to this isn't that hard. And I know I can do it. It's so true. I've got a friend that kicks my butt when I need it. And he always says to me, you know, uh, when I run into challenges too, he's like, MC, it's really simple. You're overcomplicating it. It's either a strategy issue or it's a mindset issue, you know, strategy or tactics. And if th the strategy and tactics is there, you've got a blueprint, you've got a mentor, you've got folks in your network that you know you're doing all the right things, then <laughs> like you said, it's a, it's a mindset issue. And I like, I like the analogy continuing on that eventually as you're cooking and you're getting better and better and cooking the recipe, you'll eventually start adding your own little flavor to the, the meal, right? Exactly. I mean, I know a lot of people that, that will start out in one niche and they'll evolve. They'll find marketing strategies that other people aren't doing, or they'll find locations and, and areas that other people aren't being successful, or they'll figure out how to put strategies together to create yeah. new strategies that didn't exist before. I mean, Brandon Turner is a perfect example. Anybody that follows Bigger Pockets or the Bigger Pockets podcast knows Brandon Turner. Brandon Turner came up with this idea of Burr. So buy, um, buy, uh, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. And it's not rocket science. I mean, this whole idea of buying a property, renovating it, fixing it up, refinancing, pulling out your money and doing it again is not 
it's not rocket science. Anybody right. can do this. Anybody can think of it. Um, but he put a name to it. He said, this is the strategy I'm going to focus on. And basically now he's created a whole uh, a whole new niche in real estate that people are talking about and people are doing. And everybody out there can do the same thing. You can put together different strategies, different formulas. I mean, ultimately, there are only a few ways to make money in real estate. You make money on appreciation. You make money on the tax advantages. You make money on the cash flow. You make money on, on uh, depreciation. And so you put different, you use these different strategies and tactics, you put them together in different ways and you can generate cash flow. You can generate net worth. You can generate appreciation. You can generate long-term wealth and, and they're just figure out what works for you. Yeah, absolutely. MC Lobshire, the creator of the Cashflow Ninja and Cashflow Coach at Producers Wealth, where we help our clients integrate infinite banking with their business and investments. To learn how you can create your own banking system to turbocharge your investments and business in 30 days or less, go to yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. Now, one of the things that I appreciate about you, Jay, is uh, you look at the big picture constantly, um, and you're involved in a lot of different industries too. From a, for, by the way, do check out Jay's uh, business podcast, his Bigger Pockets business, business podcast, because he's been involved in a lot of different industries and a lot of different niches, and he shares a lot of insights and things that he's learned in diff in in different niches, and you see different things. Um, and you watch the economy, you, you keep a close eye on the economy and market cycles and so forth. Um, for folks that are, that are concerned that we're at the top of a market cycle, um, we've, we've had our good run and there's a, now into 2020 in the next decade, the potential for a downturn uh, becomes bigger and bigger. Um, you've shared some ways that, you know, folks, here's the things that you can do um, to invest in basically any market, um, regardless of the condition that the market is in or where we are in the economic cycle. If you don't mind sharing some of those with our listeners and viewers. Absolutely. So yeah, the economy works in cycles and this is the way it's been for 200 years in this country and thousands of years in, in other developed nations that have had mature economies things happen in cycles and based on inflation and interest rates and, and supply and demand, the market goes up, the market goes down. Over the last 160, 170 years in the US, it's happened 33 times. We've had 33 recessions over the last 160 years, which if you do the math, that averages out to a recession every six years or so. And now it's been, what's it been, 11 years since the last one, but in reality, 11 years is a really long time. Most people these days think, oh, we could go another five or 10 years without a recession. Well, historically, when recessions happen every five or six years, it's unlikely that we're going to go 15 or 20 or 25 years without a recession. So just historically speaking, we're probably due for a downturn at some time in the near future. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to predict when it's going to happen. I don't believe anybody can predict when it's going to happen. I don't think anybody can predict how bad it's going to be. But just historically speaking, it's reasonable to assume that when something happens every five or six years over the last couple hundred years, it's probably going to happen again now that it's been 11 years relatively soon. So that said, doesn't mean it's going to be as bad as 2008. Doesn't mean everything's going to collapse. Doesn't mean that real estate's going to drop 30, 40, 50%. It just means that things are going to soften up at least. Things are going to get tougher. The economy is going to change. People are going to lose their jobs. Unemployment is going to go up. Wages may go down. Um, it, it may be that people have trouble paying their mortgages and they start you start seeing evictions go up. You may start seeing the rental market change because more people are moving in with friends or moving back with family. A lot of things are going to change. We as real estate investors, I like to say, there's never a bad time to be buying real estate. You can always buy real estate. You can always make money on real estate. The important thing is that we modify our strategies and we modify our tactics based on what's going on in the market around us. So for example, um, if back in 2008, 2008 was a great example of pretty much a worst case scenario for, for a recession. Um, not saying it can't get worse. I mean, back in the 1930s, we had a major depression. But for the most part, 2008 was kind of a worst case scenario for a recession. And yet, you could still make money buying real estate. I know a lot of people that were buying non-performing notes in 2008 that 
They held out on for three, four, five years and made a ton of money. I know a lot of people that bought uh, buy and hold real estate back in 2008, nine and 10 and have made a ton of money. I flipped a hundred houses between 2008 and 2010 and I made a lot of money. There are always ways to make money. The key is changing up your strategies, changing up your tactics. So what I would tell people is, um, if you, let's say you're flipping houses and I, we can talk about different strategies, but let's say you're flipping houses. If you're flipping houses right now, here are some of the things I would recommend. And I'm still flipping houses right now. So this is what I'm doing. One, I'm keeping projects short. I'm not too concerned about the market falling out from under me in the next two or three or four months. Might happen. Um, but I think more likely in the next two or three or four months, even if we start to see a downturn, it's not going to be a major collapse in a short period of time. I'm not that confident about nine or 12 or 18 months out. So who knows what could happen in 18 months? I'm less confident about that. So these days I'm focused on those projects that I can be in and out of in two or three or four months. I'm no longer doing the projects like the ground up construction, the major rehabs, the rehabs that require permits that take six months to get. I'm not doing those projects anymore because I don't know where the market's going to be in six or 12 or 18 months. So I'm keeping projects quick. Number two, typically speaking during a recession, the parts of the market that tend to struggle first are those price points well above the median house price and well below the median house price. So for example, let's say you live in an area where the median house price is $300,000. When the market starts to soften, when the economy starts to turn, the first place that we're going to see a struggling market is in the price points well above $300,000 and well below $300,000. So what I say is, Figure out what the median price in your market is and focus on houses that are relatively close to that median price point. Don't focus on really expensive houses in your market. Don't focus on really inexpensive houses in your market. Focus on the median price point. Third, I tell people, again, 2008 was a great barometer for kind of this worst case scenario. And so if you know what happened in your market back in 2008, you can get a pretty good idea of what the worst case scenario is for your market moving forward. And it probably won't be that bad because historically speaking, 2008 was an anomaly. Most likely the next recession and the one after that is not going to be as bad as 2008. Not promising that. I'm just saying, based on history, the next yep. couple of recessions are unlikely to be as bad as 2008. So if your market, let's say your market dropped 18% back in 2008, how average house price dropped 18% back in 2008, you can probably reasonably assume that your market during the next recession is not going to drop more than 18%. That's probably your worst case scenario. So if you're focused on flip projects that are generating at least 18% cash on cash return, at least 18% margins, it's unlikely you'll lose money on those projects. If we see a 2008 type recession now and your market drops as much as it did back in 2008 and your margins were 18%, then most likely you're going to break even. Now, if you're flipping in a place that saw 40% drops in 2008, well, you need to be a little bit more concerned. You need to be a little bit more conservative. If you are focused on a market where where prices dropped 10% in 2008, you can be more aggressive. You don't need to be as conservative. But I always like to tell people, see what your market did in 2008. And then assuming the fundamentals of your market haven't changed, and we can talk about what those are, but assuming the fundamentals of your market haven't changed, that should give you a good idea of what the worst case scenario is moving forward and should allow you to kind of mitigate your risks as long as you focus your margins at, at, that, at that point that's, that's higher than whatever that worst case scenario was. My friend Brian Page has created a cash flow machine generating over $100,000 in six months with Without owning any real estate. His system consists out of renting properties from property owners and renting them out on Airbnb. His system is so simplistic, it can be managed by virtual assistants and yet so effective and powerful that it predictably generates cash flow every month. Brian and I are hosting a webinar where he shares his system and how it generated over $100,000 in six months for him personally. You can access this life-changing webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash BNB. This is one of the greatest cash flow opportunities I've seen since I've started my podcast. Again, the URL is cashflowninja.com forward slash BNB. Now, 
if you're, let's say you're not flipping, let's say you're doing buy and hold investing. So again, we can use historical data to kind of tell us what to expect in a downturn. And we can, again, use 2008 data to kind of get an idea of what the worst case scenario is for buy and hold investors. So a couple of things I like to tell buy and hold investors. First, there's no bad time to buy and hold real estate. If you're holding for cash flow, if you find a good deal that cash flows, you can buy at any time. Doesn't matter if you're at the top of the market or the bottom of the market. As long as you're willing to hold long enough for that market to recover if things drop, you're making cash flow every month. You're making money every month. So that said, there are a few things to be aware of. Back in 2008, a lot of markets saw no change in market rent. Couple markets saw market rents go up. Worst case, some locations saw market rents drop about 10%. So again, go back to 2008. Talk to property managers in your area, talk to real estate agents in your area, talk to appraisers in your area and find the data from 2008 and see what happened with market rents. Let's say market rents dropped 5% back in 2008 to 10 in your market. When you go to underwrite a new buy and hold deal, underwrite to 5% less lower market rents, maybe underwrite to seven or eight or 10% lower market rents to be really conservative. Now, maybe in your market, market rents went up in 2008, in which case, underwrite to today's market rents, and you actually probably have some upside should the market turn. Same thing with occupancy and vacancy. Back in 2008, a lot of markets didn't see much of a change in occupancy or vacancy. Some markets saw an increase in occupancy. A bunch of markets saw a slight decrease in occupancy, five or 10%. So again, if you're buying in a market that saw a drop in occupancy back in 2008, if you're looking to buy a deal today, just underwrite it more conservatively. Assume you're going to see a, a 10% higher vacancy rate. Model that into your numbers. If your numbers still work, if it still shows cash flow, then move forward on the deal. So modeling your, your market rents differently, modeling your, your occupancy and vacancy differently, two big things. Third thing is during a recession, what we tend to see is we see this thing called uh, rent and cap rate compression, where uh, if you're A-class properties, during a recession, we tend to see a bigger drop for A-class property rent and occupancy than we do for B-class. B-class tends to drop less and sees lower, lower occupancy drop. C-class drops even less. In fact, for a lot of C-class properties, we see an increase. And it makes sense because people are moving. If you're in an A-class property, you lose your job, your wages get cut, your hours get cut. What are you going to do? You're going to move down to a B-class property. If you're in a B-class property, you're going to move down to a C-class property. If you're in a C-class property, well, you're probably not going to be homeless. You're either going to stay in that C-class property um, or you may move in with somebody else in another C-class property. So typically speaking, if you're buying at this point in the cycle, my best recommendation is don't focus on the A-class properties, focus less on the B-class properties and really focus on those B-minus C-plus class properties because during a recession, those are going to have the best opportunity for maintaining market rents, maintaining occupancy and even potentially growing. Likewise with mobile homes. Mobile homes are a great investment during a recession. I know a lot of people that are going out these days and buying mobile home parks. And they're really smart because when the recession comes, those people that really can't afford to continue living in their C-class properties are probably going to be moving down to mobile homes and, 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 uh, and, and properties like that. If you're in the commercial world, there's a lot of things in the commercial space that do well during a recession. So if you're a commercial investor, figure out what those things are that do well during a recession in the commercial space and focus on those. For example, self-storage. Self-storage is a great recession-proof investment because when people have to move out of their A-class units into B-class units or C-class units, typically they're also downsizing. Or if they're moving back with family, they're downsizing. They don't throw their stuff away. They stick it in storage. Storage facilities tend to do really well during downturns. Like I said, mobile home parks do really well during, down parks, during downturns. Um, if you want to do like commercial property, medical centers do really well during downturns. Liquor stores and uh, grocery anchored uh, 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 strip centers do really well during downturns. Um, college housing. So one of these weird things that we see during a downturn is that a lot of people go back to college. They lose their That's job right. and they say, I need new skills. So they go back to college. And what we see is that market rents and occupancies in, cal in college towns tends to spike during a downturn. So if you're concerned yeah. about a downturn, start buying college rentals, start buying um, rentals in college towns. So these are all sorts of things you can do to kind of insulate yourself from the downturn. And even 
not, not just insulate yourself, not just uh, keep yourself from losing money, but position yourself to be making a whole lot more money when the recession comes. Yeah. Those are phenomenal, phenomenal examples and just so much value in that answer. So I appreciate that. I think that'll give our listeners and viewers a lot to think about and prepare. Um, and there's a lot of things that they can incorporate within their own strategy and within their own tactics just right there. Jay, uh, one habit I've observed from just wealthy and successful folks is that they're always uh, learning. They're always studying. What are you uh, learning and studying right now? Yeah. So for me, uh, one of the things I attribute to my success in real estate and other things too, is that I'm not a real estate guy. And when I tell people that I don't know much about real estate, obviously I, I know a good bit now that I've been doing this a long time, but the truth is there are people that have been in this business for two or three or four years, as opposed to my dozen years that know a whole lot more about real estate than I do. I meet people that are jumping in doing their first flip. They've been a contractor for a dozen years. They know more about renovating houses than I'll ever know. And the key for me is I've never wanted to be a real estate guy. I don't enjoy real estate. I don't enjoy going to properties. I don't enjoy managing contractors. I don't enjoy the nitty gritty day-to-day -day real estate stuff. For me, I love running the business. I'm a business person. And the fact that I don't enjoy real estate, it makes me want to work harder at running my business efficiently so that I don't have to be on site. I don't have to be swinging a hammer. I don't have to be managing somebody who's swinging a hammer. So for me, I learn and I grow by trying to grow my business skills. Real estate's a really interesting industry because it's that one industry where people kind of jump in and say, I can start a business without ever really thinking about starting a business. Nobody's going to go open a restaurant and not think about, well, this is what my profit and loss statement's going to look like. This is how I'm going to have to hire employees. This is what my inventory and my margins are going to look like. If you're going to open a restaurant, you need to understand the business aspect. Everybody knows that. If you're going to open a shoe store, Nobody's going to go open a shoe store as, as like, oh, I think I'm going to go open a shoe store today and see how that goes. Nobody thinks that they're going to open a car dealership and say, oh, I'll give that a try, see what happens. Nobody does that. But with real estate, there are a million people that wake up and say, I'm going to go flip a house or I'm going to go buy a rental. But yep. in reality, real estate is, is a business just like any other. The inventory is just different. Instead of having a $5 piece of inventory like, uh, like a restaurant or a $100 piece of inventory like a shoe store or a $10,000 piece of inventory like a car dealership, we have two, three, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 pieces of inventory. And for some reason, people that get into real estate feel like because that inventory is so large, because you can do one deal and make enough money to kind of sustain yourself for the year or two deals or three deals, people think, I don't really need to understand the business. I'll just go do a deal. But the reality is, if you want to be in su successful in real estate, the business side is just as important as any other business you might do. So you need to understand the financials and how to do a budget, how to do a profit and loss statement, how to calculate your margins. You need to understand hiring employees and managing employees and being a leader and managing a team. You need to understand how to buy inventory. You need to understand how to market. You need to understand how to sell. You need to understand how to raise money. All these things that any other business owner in the world is obvious to them that they need to do. But for some reason, too many real estate investors say, yeah, I don't need to worry about any of that stuff. I'm just going to go flip a house. So what I like to tell people is, read business books. Don't just read real estate books. Learn to be a good business person because if you can run a business, you can run any business. I'm a business person. I don't know real estate that well, but I, I feel like I do a pretty good job of running my real estate business. I'm not a good cook. You don't want me in a kitchen, but I feel like I could run a restaurant pretty well. I'm not the best programmer or hardware guy in the world, but I started a tech company a couple years ago that did pretty well. I'm involved in a lot of businesses where I don't know the inventory in the business. I don't know the processes of the business, but because I know how to manage a business, I know how to surround myself with really smart people. I know how to manage a budget. I know how to manage a profit and loss statement. I know the basics of marketing and sales. I know how to be a team leader. Because of that, I can be successful in any business. So I tell real estate investors all the time, if you want to be a successful real estate investor, learn how to be a successful business owner first. And then the real estate part's easy. Yeah, that is 
So true right there. And it ties in nicely to my next question because you are a super entrepreneur and have started a number of, of businesses and companies and run them very successfully. Uh, and congratulations, you just launched another one. Uh, so um, if you don't mind sharing a little bit more about your your current venture and business that you're involved in and uh, some of the things that you're excited about. Yeah, absolutely. So we just started, uh, we just launched a new business this week and it's not sexy. It's not one of those that everybody's going to hear and go, oh, I want to do that. And I actually like that part of it. Um, we started a business. It's basically fire water mold re remediation. So um, some of the big names in this industry, if you've ever heard of uh, Serve Pro or Service Master, basically mm -hmm. these companies that come in, you have a flood in your house, either there's a leak or there's a natural disaster and you've got a foot of water in your basement or in your kitchen and you need somebody to come in at two in the morning to kind of clean up the house, dry it out, and then kind of put it back together. That's the company that we just started. And a lot of people look at me and they say, yeah, it doesn't seem like a really sexy company. And I've had people say to me, really? Why, why would you want to do that? Like, that just doesn't sound like fun. And I agree. It doesn't sound like fun at all. But again, for me, I look at it from the business perspective, not from the What's the day-to-day -day work? I'm not going to be the guy in there cleaning up the water. I'm not going to be the guy tearing out the moldy drywall. I'm not going to be the guy that's swinging the hammer or that's answering calls at two in the morning. I'm going to be the guy that's running the business. So when I was looking for a business, the next business to start, I didn't ask what's sexy, what's fun, what, what do I want to do? I never asked those questions. I was looking for four things in my business. I was looking for one, something that I knew something about, something where I had some level of expertise. And so for me, that's either technology or real estate. So I knew I was going to probably either do something technology related or real estate related. This is real estate related. In fact, half this business is basically just running a construction company. After the water or the mold or the fire is remediated, you need to rebuild the structure. So that's something that I know. Two, I wanted something that was recession resistant. Basically, I knew or I know that at some point, either in the next six months or year or two or three, that the market's likely going to turn down. So I didn't want to be doing something that relied on a great economy. This business is really recession proof. Basically, um, it, it's mostly insurance business. And so the insurance companies are going to pay. They don't care if the market's good or the market's bad. If somebody has a flood, they're not going to say, eh, the, the economy is bad. I'm not going to pay to have my flood remediated. Of course they are. So that was number two. Life settlement investments have allowed financial and banking institutions to not only buy their equity contractually, but also diversify their capital from any economic, market, and geopolitical risk. It's been part of the billion dollar blueprint followed by institutional investors. And if you're an accredited investor, you can also now participate in this vehicle with enormous growth potential. You can watch an informational webinar presented by one of the premier organizations providing life settlement investments for number solutions at cashflowninja.com forward slash life settlements. Number three, I was looking for something that I could really scale and grow. And this is the type of business, any city, any town in any state in this country, you're going to see businesses like this because this is something that's needed everywhere. So I can start multiple locations. I can franchise it. There's a lot of ways I can scale and grow this business. So those were kind of the top three things that I was looking for when I was starting a new business. Um, and the fourth one, and this is actually a really big one. Um, I, I say it as number four, but it may actually be number one. I was looking for a business that had a high barrier to entry. A lot of us decide, we wake up in the morning and say, I want to start a business. So what do you do? You start that business that doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of effort. It doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of skill because you just want to get started. So you go start an Amazon business or you do internet marketing or you write an ebook or you flip a house because that seems like something that doesn't take a, a whole lot of skill. Um, and those businesses are great. Nothing wrong with starting a business like that, but because it doesn't take time, money, effort, or skill, Everybody wants to start a business like that. And when everybody wants to start a business like that, you've got a ton of competition. And a ton of competition is what I didn't want. So I wanted to pick a business where there was a barrier to entry that took time, money, effort, and skill. And a business like this, basically, I need somebody that can answer the phone 24 hours a day. Who wants to deal with a business that, that you're going to get calls at 2 in the morning? And I have to find contractors that are willing to jump in a truck at 2 a.m. and go out and clean up a fire 
or clean up a clean up mold or clean up a, a, a water um, a flood. And so that's something that a lot of people don't want to deal with. I have to deal with insurance companies and a lot of people, there are benefits to insurance companies. It's nice. They're always going to pay. They're probably going to pay retail. So they're not going to like try and knock you down on price, but trying to collect from an insurance company and dealing with insurance companies and getting business from insurance companies isn't fun. So a lot of people aren't going to want to deal with that. I have to have employees. I have to have guys that are standing by ready to go fix up that first house before I ever get a phone call. If I get my first phone call and we literally got our first phone call this morning, I had to have two guys standing by ready to go deal with that before that call ever came in. So I had to hire people with zero business. We, had no, we didn't have a single phone call coming in and I still had to ha- hire somebody because when that call came in, I couldn't say, okay, great. Uh, you're, you have a flood in your house. I'm going to go hire a couple of guys in my business. We'll be there next Tuesday. I couldn't do that. Um, we had to buy vehicles. We had to buy equipment. Like literally our, our, our CapEx costs were in the, in the six figures because a business like this, you need a truck you need equipment. You have to be able to deal with anything that comes along. So there are a lot of barriers to entry in this business. And I like that because I know that not every guy and his sister is going to go start a company to compete with me tomorrow. A lot of great, great stuff right there. And I love the fact that it's high barriers to entry, because as you mentioned, you know, especially in a downturn where the, there's going to be folks uh, laid, laid off, right? They're going to lose their job. They're going to start side hustles or jump into business. And the lower the barrier of entry is, the easier for them to, to get in. Uh, that then really, really brings a lot of competition in the particular niche that you're at. Now, a core message in our show is to leave our families, communities, and the world better than we found it by passing down a mindset, values, and principles to future generations, not just money. So, Jay, if you cannot pass on any money to future generations, and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Okay, three principles. Let's start. Uh, number one, I would say always give more than you take. Um, one of my big, uh, well, one of the things I like to attribute my success in life to is I work hard to provide value to others without ever asking anything in return. Um, and I know there are a lot of people that say, yeah, you got to provide value. And yet in the back of their mind, they're always thinking when I provide this value, what am I going to get back? How am I going to get it back? How are they going to repay me? You can't do that. You literally have to be selfless and say, I'm going to provide value even if I don't think or I know I'm going to get nothing in return. And just know that eventually that's going to come back to you. You providing that value, you being the type of person that provides value, other people are going to want to give back and are going to be willing to give back when you need them to. But never go out and give value with the expectation of that return. And I always try and give more than I take or more than I ask of other people. So that's number one. Um, Number two, a lot of times we think that money is kind of the key to everything. If, if you want to help somebody be successful, you give them money. If you want to help somebody, if you want to help your family member, give them money. If you want to help your kids, give them money. I'm a big believer that inspiration and motivation can be just as important in money, that just as important as money. Instead of telling my friends, hey, you need something, let me know, I'll give you some money. Instead of telling a family member, hey, you're starting a business, I'll invest. Instead, be their biggest cheerleader inspire them, motivate them, be the person that when, as entrepreneurs, being an entrepreneur is a lot of times, and you know this as well, probably a lot of your listeners, it's not fun being an entrepreneur a lot of the times. It's lonely. You wake up half the time thinking, oh, I have to get out of bed today and go tackle this problem that I'm terrified to tackle or that I've been dreading having to tackle or something bad happens and you turn around to, to talk to your partner about it and you realize, I don't have a partner. It's just me. I'm an entrepreneur. I don't have a boss. I don't have somebody I can, like, I, that I can hand this off to. You have to deal with it. So just being there for people and providing inspiration, providing motivation and providing moral support and providing um, just, just that, 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 that support to people around you is often a lot more important than saying, Hey, how can I help you? Can I give you money or can I give you this or give you that? So, so provide that support to people because oftentimes that's the thing that they really need that they may not even realize. Uh, And then number three is one plus one doesn't equal two in the business world, in life, one plus one equals three or five or 10 or 50. In other words, have an abundance mentality. Realize that life and business isn't a zero sum game. If I do well today, if I make money today, it's not because somebody else has to do poorly today or lose money today. If I help you, if you help me, 
It's not one of us has to win and the other has to lose. I can help you and we can both win. We can build more together than we can build independently. So I tell people, don't hide from, from your friends. Don't even hide from your enemies. Collaborate. Figure out how you can work together with people to build something greater than the two of you or the three of you or the five of you could build independently. One plus one doesn't equal two in this world. One plus one equals a whole lot more if you do it right and you have that right, if you have that abundance mentality. It's so true. The abundance mentality is uh, is something that is just quite incredible. Once you embrace it and you experience it and you incorporate it, uh, so couldn't agree with you more. Jay, where can uh, listeners and viewers learn more about you? Where can they follow you? And where can they stay informed of all the project, the many, many projects and businesses that you're involved with? Yes. Yeah, so uh, my main website is jscott.com. Uh, you can find out about me there. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Bigger Pockets. Uh, I've written four books. If anybody's interested in the books, you can go to amazon.com and do a search for Jay Scott, or they're all sold through biggerpockets.com. Um, um, and yeah, that's, that's me. If anybody wants to reach out to me, Jay at jscott.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and your knowledge and providing so much value for my listeners. This is going to be one of those episodes that you want to re-listen to because there's just so much value that you packed in here for us, Jay. So really appreciate it. And for our listeners and viewers, I would highly recommend Jay's books too. Check out the podcast. There's a ton of value like this on demand uh, for you to consume to help you on your journey uh, and uh, help you accomplish your goals. So thank you so much again for coming on the show. Thanks, MC. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives. Such situation and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.